Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today for Sketchbook Sunday, we're gonna paint this cheerful beta fish in gouache, and we're gonna work on canvas instead of the typical sketchbook. Um, it did present some challenges, but I persevered after a hissy fit, and it turned out to my liking. This video is brought to you by SmartArtBox.com. They send out monthly subscription boxes full of art supplies, and this month's was filled with lots of goodies. Uh, it came with this beautiful large palette. Oh, they had a lot of areas to put your paint in, a lot of wells along the edge, and a lot of places to mix your paint. And I used it all during this painting. The nice thing about gouache is that um, if I squirted out my palette today, it's still going to be reactivatable tomorrow if I need to finish a painting over a couple of days. And I did on this one because I was so frustrated. Um, this kit comes with a brochure that tells you about the products that are in there if you're unfamiliar with them. And there's also a project on the back in case you don't know what to paint. This box came with two Princeton snap brushes, and that line usually runs for about three to five dollars a brush, which is nice for students because it's a good quality brush, but very economical. I got two canvas panels, and I decided I'm going to use the big one because I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I should have went with the small one first, <laughs> and it came with a set of Savoir Faire gouache. I am familiar with this brand of gouache because that's the first brand I ever used. Uh, it used to be quite expensive, um, but it's come down in price over the years, and this is imported by the Savoir Faire company from France. And actually, that's the same company that imports the Sennelier line of products. So um, that kind of gives me good feelings about this line of paint that they're involved in Sennelier. Of course, I can't really put any direct comparisons between Sennelier watercolors and the Savoir Faire gouache because gouache and watercolors, other than being rewettable once dry, they're really different animals. So I'm going to go ahead and get my palette set up, and then we're going to begin painting together. Oh, I also wanted to mention that this paint set comes with a small, I would say about number two camel hair brush. So um, that's also there, but it's not really that useful on canvas. That would be more if you're really gonna water that paint down and use it like a watercolor. So I just don't want anyone getting frustrated if they have this set and they get that brush in there and it's not pushing the paint around. In fact, you'll see towards the end of this tutorial that I go in with some of my regular uh, golden tacklon brushes just because I needed a little more variety for what I was trying to do. So I'm unwrapping the canvas and I've got my paint squirted out and I'm just going to sketch with this number four round that came in my smart art box. Um, I'm starting with a teardrop shape for the fish's head and body, uh, kind of a rectangle for the back of the body where it's twisted. And I'm just putting kind of like swirly lines for the, um, I want to call it plumage, but it, they're fins, but the way they flutter out kind of reminds me of bird's plumage. I don't paint fish very often, but I've had a few beta fish. I don't know if you remember, like probably about 20 years ago, it was popular to send flowers like peace lilies and they would have the fish swimming underneath and I received one of those and I was kind of really mad that they would sell those. That just seems so wrong because I don't think you should ever give somebody a pet as a gift. I think that's that a pet has to be such a personal, um, uh, such a personal choice. And I received one of those and um, that fish, boy, that fish lived for a few years. Um, there's a little red betta fish and it's in that bowl. But I remember seeing, being so worried that it was too hot or too cold or Oh, pet responsibility. Don't give pets, especially with Easter coming up. Please don't give pets to children, to anybody, because, um, you know, a, a bunny for Easter should be made out of chocolate or stuffed, stuffed, cuddly plush thing, not not a real bunny, okay? Um, I'm blocking in colors now, and I'm noticing that uh, the canvas texture is, um, it's a little more difficult to move my gouache around than it would be on my watercolor paper or my mixed media paper. Now, I tend to work in a sketchbook with my gouache because it works so well on sketchbook paper. It doesn't have to be really thick watercolor paper or mixed media paper. So I'm used to that smoother surface. So this was giving me some challenges and honestly, I'm blocking in now, but I've got some serious doubts. Um, it's funny because I actually started narrating this tutorial. It was gonna be real time and I was thinking, this will be like half an hour, this will be simple. Um, it, it, I was really struggling. I was struggling getting any form here. Um, to me, this looked, I was just, I was, it would have been comical if I wasn't so irritated at this stage. Um, I'm using some violet. I did put a little black out on my palette, but I'm actually using violet as my dark color. I did work quite effectively. Um, I've got a couple reds. I've got the kind of warmer of the yellows, a violet. I put out a little bit of 
teal. I'm not sure what I was going to, or aquamarine, I think it was called. Um, I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to use that for, but I like that color and I thought it'd be pretty. Um, the reference photo that I used that I'll link below is, has a black background and I really didn't think I wanted a black background, but I still put some down and look at the teeny amounts of paint there. If I was painting on paper, like sketchbook paper, that would have been an ample amount, but the canvas really grabs it. Now, one thing I realized was an advantage to the canvas is that you can layer. So, and, it, and you can layer without reconstituting the bottom layers if you don't want to. If you want to, you can go in and scrub those layers out, but it gives you the ability to build up a lot more than you would have on paper, especially on a sketchbook paper, which is only going to take so much use and abuse before it starts to pill. So um, this is my first time using gouache on a canvas. And um, once I kind of realized to go with the flow a little bit more, it got a lot better. Um, I was kind of in a funk too when I was painting this. And I think your attitude when you're, um, when you're working can really affect the outcome. I mean, a hot mess stage was <laughs> so long in this. I feel like I was just in the hot mess stage forever. So at this point I was just looking at this thinking, what have I painted? This looks so, uh, just so not what I wanted it to look like. It looks very kind of like naive, which isn't necessarily a bad style, but it just wasn't what I was going for. And you know, you get a picture in your mind's eye of what you want. And when it doesn't happen, it doesn't matter if it looks okay. It just, if it's not doing what you want it to do, it's so frustrating. Um, even though I could look at this, if like, you know, somebody I knew painted this, I'd be like, it's charming, it's adorable, you know, but um, that's not what's in my mind's eye. It's not what I wanted to paint. So uh, I basically decided I was going to put a background in and see if that did anything to help my painting. Um, I needed way more paint than I thought I was going to. So I just kept, you know, I put down a few different shades and I figured, what the heck? I didn't swatch this paint out. I'm going to see what these other colors look like. I realized that the ultramarine blue was kind of like a more intense version of cobalt. So it's probably like the same pigment. Uh, there was, there wasn't really a good cold blue. There was, um, that teal, but there wasn't like a really good cool blue. Um, I didn't use any of the greens in the set. So, but there were greens. So I'm sure like with all those colors, you have a good range, but I was kind of disappointed that there was an oppression or a phthalo blue. And instead I had a cobalt and ultramarine, which are very similar colors. So, um, that's one thing I would just make a note of. Uh, the violet was nice. Again, I think you would be able to mix a really good violet with like the magenta and the ultramarine. So I don't know how necessary that was, but it is a nice, uh, robust violet. Now, as far as uh, opacity with these paints, they're obviously more opaque than watercolor, but I, they didn't strike me as super opaque. So I think if you were to water them down and use that little brush that came with it, you'd actually get to have a fairly decent watercolor set on your hands. That said, um, these dried in the palette overnight and they definitely cracked and came off the palette. It wasn't a big deal because my palette was laying flat on my table. So I'd only take out what you want to use in a session because you'd have to add a lot of glycerin to them to make them, um, to make them hold together. So definitely just take out what you need. Um, so what I'm doing here, <laughs> I am adding some, I'm actually adding some black here at this point and uh, making some shadows. And what I realized when I added the black to that red, I got a beautiful like burgundy plum. Um, you know, like the color of wine, like if you have a glass of red wine, that's like the color it made. It was just gorgeous. The black is really, must be really blue undertoned. It's a beautiful color. Um, and generally blacks, blacks are more flat, but this, the black in this set is really nice. Uh, I have no qualms with this paint at all. Uh, the whites were opaque. Um, as you can see, we're going to be doing some bubbles on top of stuff later on. Um, but I have, I have no qualms with the paint. I think my biggest issue here was trying to paint on canvas. I, I you know what, it reminds me a lot of acrylics. And as I've mentioned before, I'm not a a big fan of acrylics. I might use acrylics as an underpainting under oils. I use acrylics a lot in like home decor projects. I've been painting wood. Um, but like if I'm painting wood, that's a pretty smooth surface, or I might be stenciling or gel press printing or something like that where I'm, where I'm not using a direct painting technique with my acrylics. So I was finding, I was feeling a lot of the frustration that, um, that, I have with acrylics by painting gouache on canvas. I think if you like to paint with acrylics and you know, I think you would really enjoy painting this painting on a canvas with acrylics with really no alteration um, to what I'm doing here with gouache. Because one technique that I use a lot with gouache, which would be blending into a dry layer, I really didn't do here. Um, I found that that technique was not that, um, uh, was not 
as conducive on a canvas. That ca that technique is much better on paper. On canvas, I felt like layering was a way to go because you had that tooth that would just let you keep going and going and going and adding more and more and more. And at this point, I'm feeling a little bit better about um, about this piece. I'm able to get some highlights in there and um, just, I, I feel build up a little bit better so I don't feel like everything is just a big mishmash. I'm trying to think if this was, if I painted this on day one or day two, I'm trying to see what color sleeve I have <laughs> so I can tell. Um, oh, that's day two. That's day two. I'm feeling much more positive. <laughs> that's my nightgown actually. I'm feeling much more positive about this painting right now. Um, sometimes you just need to give your eyes a break. I actually decided to go do some errands. I went to the grocery store and picked up my kids from school and um, basically didn't even look at it all night. And then the next morning I came out and, and worked on this and I was really enjoying this so much more. And I also grabbed some more brushes because I was getting frustrated with the two brushes that came in the kit. When you're working on canvas, because you have that extra drag and when you're working on it with a thicker paint like gouache, you want paint brushes that have a little bit more stiffness to them. So I could see, definitely see using a hog brush. I didn't use a hog brush here, but I could see why you might use a hog brush or brushes with shorter bristles like Bright's. Be, or our small flats or even filberts in lieu of round brushes. Now this kit did come with a filbert, but it was a, a fairly larger one with longer bristles. So it's it's tougher to push that more viscous paint around. Um, when you're working with watercolor, you want those really softer, floppier brushes that will hold more water. So you just gotta make sure you're, you're matching your brush bristles to what you're trying to move around here. Now at this point I thought, I am gonna go more bold with my color. Um, I felt that the fish didn't really have that much form. Uh, maybe I should have fanned the the, the fins out a little bit more than what the reference photo showed. So that's what I'm kind of doing here. And I'm using a comma stroke technique, which is kind of a decorative painting technique where you take a round brush or a filbert and you load up your paint and you kind of press to make a rounded tip stroke and you drag it fine. So I'm pressing at the outside of the fin and dragging it in just to give the fins a little bit more fullness. And also um, I just wanted a little bit more uh, body to them. Now I realized that my fish was off center, which I mean, I don't like to put things smack dab in the middle because that can limit where your eyes travel. And I just felt like I needed more color. I needed more pattern. I needed something going on, some rhythm. And so I thought bubbles would be a really good solution to this problem. So I just used um, a small round brush. I'm using the, actually the Mimic uh, Kalinsky brushes from Jerry's Autorama. They are, I like the Mimic Squirrels more, which are a faux squirrel for watercolor, but the Mimic Kalinskys, um, they're also sold for watercolor, but they work a little better for gouache because they're a little bit stiffer and they can push that paint a little bit more. I'm probably about 45 minutes um, to an hour in on this painting and I'm trying to do a little refining. Like there's a highlight on the, like under the mouth on the bottom side of the face. Um, I had the eyes a little kind of too buggy. Uh, even though they are kind of buggy, they just looked almost cartoonish, which this, this piece does have a cartoonish feeling to it, but I didn't want it like super cartoonish, I guess. You know, you get a picture in your mind and um, and you're, you know, trying to make it more like that. Um, the thing that I like about gouache is that if I go in and put a highlight in, I can then go back and later with a wet brush and I can I can smear it out a little bit or I can tone it down, I can mix into it. Um, I didn't do too much of that like I mentioned before, but that is one of the nice benefits of gouache. One thing I was worried about working on a canvas and the reason I haven't before is I was worried about the paint flaking off. So after, um, when I came back to this painting the next day, I actually kind of tried scraping some of it with my fingernail to see if any of it was gonna flake off on me. And luckily it didn't. Um, but then again, it you know if you're working on paper and you're flexing your paper, if you had thick passages of gouache, it could pop off your paper too. It's just that uh, you know gum arabic can bind to paper a little bit better than canvas. But that said, this canvas shouldn't flex because it's a canvas panel, not a stretch canvas. I probably wouldn't recommend using gouache on a stretch canvas because of the flexibility and because it may have a harder time binding. But on the, uh, the canvas panel, it didn't have any trouble at all, which was a relief. Um, I was like, I wasn't too worried yesterday because I was like, oh my word, hot mess. You know, this is going to the bonfire for sure. But, uh, but now I actually think it's kind of cute and I would think it'd be really cute in like a, I, you know, it'd be cute in like a, like a, a pediatrician's office or something, I think, because it's really kind of kind of whimsical. Uh, so I'm just going in with the black. I'm mixing the black with that red, that first red that I squeezed out. Um, I think it was uh, Carmine. And I just love that. I love that dark because it's not like a dead black. It definitely has this kind of like plummy 
um, undertone, like the, like the skin of a plum. It's just such a pretty black when you add it in with that red. So it might be kind of nice to mix that in with other colors. I bet if you mix that in with like, you could do the Zorn palette with the squash pretty well if you use that black, that, and so if you use that black, a, um, like a cat, no, that black, a yellow ochre, you could make, definitely make a green with those two. Um, so that might be the next thing I try with that, actually, because that's such a lovely black. Uh, so with the bubbles, I wanted to add some rhythm and just some pattern and interest and life because I've got this like fluttery fish, but nothing happening happening in the background. And I wanted the feeling of like moving water. So the bubbles really helped that and also helped me um, tie in some colors so I could take pretty much any of the colors that I used on the fish and add that to the bubble. I could add white to it to make it pastel and iridescent looking. And um, I just had a lot of fun with it, really. I used the bubbles to kind of balance out the picture and to add rhythm and repetition and these different elements of design, which when you've got a painting that's just not working very well, knowing these different rules or elements of design can help you a lot in um, kind of pulling something together, making something of, of a painting that's not working very well. I was glad to have all of this mixing space. Um, I decided to take some of the yellow that I had out of my palette and some of that teal color and mix it together. I, I'd like to see different colors I can get because anything's fair game if I've already used it. And I made this pretty kind of chartreuse color, which really made those bubbles kind of pop or <laughs> excuse the pun, come alive. Uh, and I think any color that you've used is fair game. Just mix it up different, see what you can get. And uh, also that green makes the red um, seem a little bit more lively and vibrant. And also using that blue background makes the orange tones in the fish really come to life. So it's kind of playing with those opposites to make things seem more vibrant. Um, and something I noticed with these colors, be, because there's no pigment information on the tubes, um, it's kind of hard to know what you're going to get as far as like, will the paints be chalky? Will they be vibrant? How are they going to mix? I didn't have any problems mixing anything here. Nothing went muddy in the least, which was, um, which was really nice. I didn't use any browns, but, um, you know, I, I definitely could make a brown if I wanted to, but nothing accidentally went to mud, which is a nice feature. So I think that's going to be nice if you're a beginner getting this set and, uh, and trying to mix with it. I like to jam as much color as possible in the bubbles because I wanted that iridescence, even though bubbles under the water wouldn't have that, like soap bubble look that, you know, when you blow bubbles, but this is my world and my painting and I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to use the colors that I want. And honestly, I had a great freedom when I was painting at this stage where, you know, I was ready to chuck the thing in the bonfire the day before. So I had nothing to lose. I did not worry about ruining this because I was pretty much sure I was, it was a goner. Um, that is freedom folks. When you have hit that wall with your painting where you're like, well, nothing left to lose. That's when you make your breakthroughs when you're not afraid to try. I took some of the blue, the medium blue I used in the background and just added little slices of it in between the fins. So that could be some light coming through that could just be accent lines, but it gave a lot of vibrancy and movement and actually almost a color vibration because putting that blue right next to an orange patch breaks up that solid dead orange and inserts some liveliness because as those color molecules are bouncing against each other, I have no idea if there's any scientific backup to this, but as you have those complementary colors sliced right next to each other, they make each other vibrate more, like the colors vibrate more. Now for a final detail, I'm adding some bubbles on top of the fish. I figured having that perspective, having that kind of like veil of, of space in front of the fish would integrate him more into the scene. I also took some of those blues and mimicked the contour of the fish in the background to give it, to give the water more life and movement. Cause those fish just kind of flit around quickly in their bowl. And they're always like, like swishing the gravel. If you have them in a fish bowl or fish tank, they're, you know, they're darting around and I wanted to catch that kind of, um, that kind of vibrancy. And then I took some of the ultramarine blue and added some under some of the bubbles towards the bottom of the painting to kind of weight the bottom of the painting a little bit and give it a little more depth. Now, something I was struggled with and I actually took a little break. Um, I had my lunch, drank a cup of tea and I was like, well, something is, this is off balance. I need to do something. And I 
I realized the thing I needed was one giant bubble um, to kind of balance the fish kind of in the bottom third here, kind of where the, your, your lines would intersect. I had a hard time freehanding this one for some reason, so probably because it was now I was liking the painting and so now the stakes were high because I liked what I was doing. So I just took a little cup and overturned it on my canvas and traced it with a loaded brush with white. And that worked great for a nice round bubble. All the other ones are freehand, but if you do little dabs and drabs of paint, you can really can't tell that it's not a perfect circle. And they don't have to be. I mean, it's totally fine to have these organic shaped bubbles a bit because, you know, they're floating through the water um, or through the sky. I mean, this is a little surreal, I guess, with these bubbles, but uh, I just had a lot of fun with them. And I think they added the playfulness that I wanted in the painting that I was so frustrated with by not getting it. Um, during the first day I worked on this. So all in all, this took me about an hour and a half, um, but I was pleased with the outcome and I never thought that I was going to like this. I actually just started painting on this this morning thinking that, well, you know, this will warm me up and then I'll do something serious. I'll do something real. Then I'll, you know, make something right with these paints. This is just my warm up. This is my swatch, if you will. But, you know, the freedom of not worrying if you ruin it or not is powerful. And uh, and I ended up with something that I really liked. Uh, for final, uh, final touch, I um, added some more highlights on things and I did do a little dashes of orange to show the uh, the fin through that bubble because I thought the bubble was getting a little too opaque. So I like to save some really, really bright highlights and some really, really dark shadows for my last step just to crisp everything up. Um, and that, you know, pretty much does it. Uh, I had a lot of fun, like I mentioned with this. I would definitely um, recommend these paints if you're looking for an inexpensive gouache set. I don't know if there'll be any of this set available at smartartbox.com, but I will link to them. You can see if they have it available to purchase. If you subscribe, you get a surprise every month. Um, so I will link these products down below as well in case you want to find anything that I used. Um, but if you already have gouache at home, I would use that because um, you certainly don't, there's, there's nothing special about these paints. They're just decent. So I want to thank you so much for watching. I want to thank Smart Art Box for sponsoring this video. And until next time, happy crafting.